Well, I want to say welcome to Cross Community Church. If you're our guest today, we're really grateful that you've chosen to gather with us and worship together with us. This is a day that we celebrate the biggest day of the year for uh, Christians. And listen, if it's bigger than Christmas, it's a pretty big deal, right, for believers in Jesus Christ. Uh, we're here to celebrate the resurrection. Now, if, if you're not sure about what all the excitement um, of Easter is about, like why in the world do we get so geeked out about this? This time, this celebration, well, I, I want to spend some time uh, speaking to you about that today. Uh, but I want to be clear on the front end. Uh, we do not get all that excited about the bunny that lays pastel colored eggs filled with candy, right? That's not exactly what we're excited about. If you're an older person, uh, we're not all that excited about uh, the old school eggs that we used to get and eat uh, that were hard boiled, had a full serving of protein and some egg dye in them, right? That's, we're not excited about the trappings that ultimately come with kind of the cultural celebrations. Now, my kids are probably going to uh, hunt eggs. They're going to get candy. I'm going to steal it just like you. However, I want to give you today kind of the focus of Easter and why it is that Christians would celebrate this even kind of a, a level even above Christmas. And, and the reason for that is because if there is no resurrection, if Jesus Christ did not raise from the dead, everything that we believe and everything that we're here celebrating, everything that you know, you've ever heard, it's all in vain. And you might think that's a little bit abrupt for a pastor to be like, hey, this could be a big sham and it could be a big farce. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, if he didn't rise up from the grave, then we're all wasting our time. But that's not my argument. That is actually the argument that the Apostle Paul makes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to paraphrase him a bit, but here's what the, uh, the Apostle Paul says about why the resurrection is so critical to us, why the resurrection is so fundamental to the Christian faith. He says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, if there is no resurrection, then Jesus Christ isn't raised, which means the Savior, the one that we're depending upon to rescue us from our sins, means he's dead. He's still in the grave. If there is no resurrection, then our preaching, and, and, and not just ours, but Peter and Paul and all the apostles, the men you read about in the Bible, Paul says that preaching is in vain. It's worthless. If there is no resurrection, then our faith is empty hope. If there is no resurrection, then we're still condemned in our sins. If there is no resurrection, there's no hope for you or for me or for our deceased loved ones. If there is no resurrection, then the Apostle Paul says that Christians, above every other person who exists on this planet, are to be pitied most. But if there is a resurrection, if Jesus Christ really did rise from the grave, victorious over sin and death, if Jesus really did rise, that changes everything. If a man came to earth and he lived and was crucified by the Romans on a cross, they were expert executioners. If he went to the grave and spent three days there and then came up out of the grave, resurrected, all the while claiming to be God, we might should listen to what he has to say. So today I want to give you just kind of three fundamental truths of Christianity, kind of the baseline stuff. Paul calls these the first things that we will believe as Christians. And so I'm going to be honest with you, this isn't all of it. Like as we uh, are believers in Jesus Christ, we grow in the knowledge of the word and how Jesus has worked on our behalf, kind of the fullness of the gospel. But I want to just give you three kind of first things of Christianity. I'll let you kind of evaluate them for yourself. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to begin in verse 3. Paul is writing to a church in Corinth that uh, he, he visited before. He's writing them a letter to kind of teach them about how they should live and exist and kind of follow after Jesus Christ. And in writing this letter, he's talking to them. He's going to speak about the importance of the resurrection. But before he goes there, he reminds them of kind of the, the foundational truths of Christianity. Here it is, verse 3. 
He says, for I delivered to you, this is when he'd been with them before preaching to them, for I delivered to you uh, as of first importance what I also received. When I say the first things, Paul says, these are the things of first importance. Like you get this and it opens everything else up for you. He tells us what those three things are. The first is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. The second is that he was buried. And the third, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now, almost nobody uh, today, I would guess if we were to poll most of you, almost nobody disputes the fact that Jesus did indeed live here on this earth. Uh, it's, it's well attested throughout history that Jesus lived in the region of Galilee or Capernaum. He was born in the place called Nazareth. There's lots of evidence, even from unbelieving sources, that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, the Messiah. If you'll remember, there was a placard placed on the cross when he was crucified that said, King of the Jews, right? Most everyone knows or believes that Jesus came and lived on this earth, ultimately that he was crucified by the Romans on the cross and almost everybody believes that he was buried. It's well attested. But there are two facets of Christianity, or two of these things that are asserted here, um, that not everyone would, would believe. And I would argue that it's a tragedy that they don't. The, the first is this. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, really the sins of the world. Not everybody would believe that. And, and in a sense, doesn't the gospel sound a little too good to be true? I mean, I don't know about you, but as I look back over the course of my life, I look out here, I know many of you, and you know me too. I look back over the course of my life, and I have sinned. And I've sinned in some pretty grave ways. There are some of you that, as I, I see you, I know that I've hurt you at times. You've heard the, the poor choice of words. You've seen me at my worst of moments. Like, you know that I've sinned. And when I think about this claim that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, it sounds a little too good to be true. I mean, think about this. God is perfectly righteous and just and holy in every way. He creates the heavens and the earth. He creates us. And we, as his creations, rebel against him. We sin against him. We don't follow his paths. Like, we just rebel against God. And to think that that God, rather than giving us what we deserve, which is our punishment or death, to think that God would instead look at me, To see the things that I'm ashamed of. To see my worst of moments. And that God would respond to me with love instead of with wrath. Seems a little too good to be true, doesn't it? That God seeing you in your sin and me in my sin, the sins of your worst enemy. And that God would look upon those sins and rather than pour out wrath, which is what we deserve, he would instead choose to offer his son for us? Doesn't that sound a little too good to be true? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. But it goes further than that. Because as you look into the scriptures, we know that as Jesus went to the cross, that God sent his son Jesus to the cross to bear the weight of our sins. That means Jesus came, he lived a perfect life, and really the point of his life was to endure the punishment that you and I deserve. It's well attested throughout history that Jesus was indeed arrested. He was beaten. They drove nails through his wrists and his ankles. They hung him there on the cross, thrust a spear through his side. The first and central claim of Christianity is that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, which means Jesus was there enduring the punishment that you and I deserve for our sins. And that what happened there on that cross is that God took all of the sins of the world, the, uh, of the sins of all of us who would come to faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He took those sins and he placed them on the shoulders of his son, Jesus. And there on the cross, the wrath of God against sin, the just punishment that we deserve, was poured out on Jesus. 
And God took that perfect, sinless life of Jesus, and he credited that life, that righteousness, that holiness, to those who would come to faith in him. Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? But he wasn't done. Because Jesus said, listen, the enemy has come to steal, kill, and to destroy. But I came that they might have life and have it to the fullest. And so God didn't just come to save us from our sins. God also came. Jesus offered his life on the cross that we might experience a new life in him. I don't know what your life's been like at this point, but if I'm just being honest with you, I'm a 40-year-old pastor, and there have been sins too big for me to handle. There have been things I couldn't turn away from on my own that I have legitimately in an adult manner wrestled with, and I could not uh, overcome the grip of sin in my life. But the scriptures tell us that Jesus came that we might have life and have it to the fullest, that we don't have to be ruled by our sin and the brokenness of this world, but we could walk a new path. We could follow after Jesus Christ and live the life which Jesus describes as the fullest life or the life that is abundant. It's a life of freedom from sin and a life of freedom from death. first claim of Christianity. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, for your sins, and for my sins. It's well attested throughout history that he did indeed die there. But how do we know? How can we be sure that it was indeed that he did that for us? I mean, it's hard to go back and, and, you know, read throughout history and know the motives of Jesus or what he was ultimately seeking to accomplish. We can know what he claimed to be doing. We can know what the apostles or his disciples told us he was doing, but how can we be sure that Jesus died on the cross for our sins? Again, I would point you to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that third claim, that after three days in the grave, Jesus rose victorious over sin and death. The apostle Paul was reasoning with some Epicurean philosophers, some Stoics uh, in Athens. He was on Mars Hill, and he goes in kind of the the public marketplace, the meeting area where people would, you know, get together to discuss various ideas. It was kind of the center of the world in terms of thought at the time. And Paul begins to reason with these men who had different philosophies about how life functioned or why we existed, and he began to testify to them about Jesus Christ and about what he had done, that he was indeed the savior of the world and he offers to them one thing as proof that what he was telling them was true you know what he offered him as proof the resurrection of Christ and the interesting thing about that is when Paul uttered those words there would have been men alive who had still been witnesses to the resurrected Christ In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul lays out, he's writing a letter to the the Corinthian church, and he's like, hey, I'm going to list a bunch of witnesses who have seen Jesus resurrected. He's like, most of them are still alive today. You can go talk to them. If you would have lived in the first century around this region, you could have gone and and had a conversation with eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ that he did indeed raise from the dead. Look what he says here in, in, we'll pick up in verse 4. Or verse 3, he says, I delivered to you as of first importance what I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas, this is Peter, and then to the twelve, these were his disciples. And after that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now. You can go to ask them. If you think I'm a liar, go have a conversation. Although some had fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, and then to apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. Paul's like, listen, I've risked my life for this. I've been in danger. I've been persecuted. I've been shipwrecked. I've been beaten. I've been imprisoned because I saw the resurrected Jesus Christ. If the resurrection is true, and we believe it is, then that changes everything. That means that God did indeed come in the flesh and that he did indeed die on the cross for your sins, that you didn't have to face them on your own, that you didn't have to bear the punishment for those sins, not now and not in eternity, but instead you could begin walking in a new life in Christ Jesus. 
Today, I want to share with you a story. I want you to hear the testimony of a young man who is finding new life in Christ Jesus. It didn't just happen 2,000 years ago. It's happening today. Would you guys welcome Dustin to the stage with us? Good morning. I'm not quite as well rehearsed, so I'm going to be reading from the script. I hope you guys are okay with that. Hi, my name is Dustin. I have new life in Christ, and I'm recovering from lustful fantasies, pornography, and adultery. I grew up with a mother and father who both had issues with substance abuse. It was so bad, my parents lost custody of my siblings and I, and we went to live with a foster family first, and then with my grandmother. She took care of us for three years before my parents straightened up enough to take us back. Though my childhood wasn't ideal, we were encouraged to attend church often. I learned about the Ten Commandments, Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, and memorized John 3.16. My early understanding of God was as a judge who punished us when we stepped out of line. While I learned these things at church, my home life was drastically different. After moving back in with my parents, I was exposed to more substance abuse, pornographic material, adulterous relationships, as well as the toxic relationship of my parents. When I was in the fifth grade, some neighborhood friends started talking to my brother, sister, and I about our need for Jesus in our lives and often took us to church with them. After a short time, they also helped walk me through asking Jesus into my heart. My home life hadn't changed, though, and it was in this same year I was exposed to pornography and sexual literature. This wasn't the beginning of my sexual sin, but it started a new sinful cycle in my life. A division between my home life and my church life began to grow. When I was 11, my mother left. She went to get milk from Quick Trip and didn't come back. We cried ourselves to sleep for weeks and prayed daily for God to send our mother home to us. Years later, she explained that she left to escape the physical and emotional abuse from my father, but I didn't know that at the time. Not long after the divorce was finalized, my father remarried and planned to move several hours away. We were offered the choice to stay with my grandmother or move away with my father. I decided to stick with my father and younger sister who had just turned two. My brother and sister decided to stay. Having already been separated from my parents just a few years before, I couldn't stand the thought of losing both of them again. I felt abandoned by my mother, felt I had no choice but to go with my father, and our family was again divided. By my later years in high school, I'd become involved in my local church. I was attending regularly and was even baptized as a public profession of my faith. I tried to display my Christian walk more and more publicly and was even ridiculed at school and at work for it. This didn't make up for the fact that I still separated my home life from my public Christian life and was consumed by sexual sin. I began having premarital sex in addition to my continued problems with pornography and masturbation. I experimented with drug use and even alcohol abuse did not seem that wrong to me. The rift in my public and private life grew larger. Before I married my first wife, I started an affair with a woman that carried almost a year into my marriage. My wife and I were both involved in our church through our entire relationship, but I hid my sexual sins behind my public display of faith. I was living what most call a double life, and it took a huge toll on me. I was constantly worried that my wife would find out about the affair, and the feelings of shame and guilt overwhelmed me continuously. After calling the affair off, I tried to find satisfaction in my wife, but as I didn't close the door to lustful fantasies, it was only a short period of time before I once again looked outside my marriage for sexual satisfaction. For me, this starts with poor content control, then unchecked lustful thoughts, followed by masturbation and porn use. I knew it was wrong, but felt powerless to control my thoughts, desires, and actions. Over and over, I went through the damaging cycle of falling to my fleshly desires, feeling overwhelming shame and guilt, repenting and swearing never to do it again, and then falling into the pit of sexual sin once more. A few short years later, I again committed adultery. About a month after that, I confessed to my wife that I cheated on her and that I wanted a divorce. I was so consumed with fulfilling my own selfish desires that I cast away my marriage, ignoring what the Bible has to say about divorce in order to pursue sins of the flesh. While we were going through the divorce, my adultery became public knowledge, and I was ashamed and embarrassed. I felt like I couldn't show my face in church, and I quit attending. When I needed God the most, I turned away. As my next long-term relationship developed, we discovered that we had differing religious beliefs and never sought a church home. 
Our relationship was off and on a lot in the beginning, and depression took a strong hold on me. I felt so alone and hurt that at one point I put a loaded gun to my head and began pulling the trigger. God had other plans and wouldn't allow me to take my own life. Suicide doesn't stop things from getting better. It only stops the, uh, suicide, suicide doesn't stop things from getting worse. It only stops them from getting better. I don't know where I first heard that statement, but it has stuck with me over the years when thoughts of suicide have come up. My relationship with God continued to struggle over the next several years. Though he was faithful to, to, to convict me often and remind me that my sexual sin was not hidden, regardless of my intentions to keep it that way. Late in my second marriage, I came across a self-help book that outlined practical ways to use biblical advice and scripture to turn away from pornography and sexual sin. I tried to use some of its teachings to fix my rapidly failing marriage from the damaging patterns of my sin. What I didn't understand at the time was the strong connection my sin had to my past hurts, habits, and hang-ups. I needed more than this book to turn my life around. I needed community, accountability, and most of all, I needed God. I didn't realize that I was powerless over my addictions, brokenness, and sinful patterns. I thought that I had the power to manage my own life. It wasn't enough. In March of 2018, my wife and my daughter moved out. I'd been away from church for close to 10 years after my first divorce. Facing a second divorce and reeling from the damage of years of sin, I was once again struggling with loneliness and depression. God knew that and moved things into place to begin my healing process. One of my close friends invited me to his church repeatedly until I said that I would come just to get him to quit asking. That was in the summer of 2018, and I've been coming back to Cross Community ever since. One of the things that kept me coming back was the openness and honesty of the staff. Honesty from one of the pastors in particular struck a chord with me, a man named Jason that openly spoke of his past struggles with sexual sin. I don't know this from private conversations, but from him boldly standing on stage and including his struggles and his sermons to the entire congregation. His testimony gave me renewed hope that it was possible to overcome the struggles in my life. What I'd been missing all of those years of struggling to overcome my sexual sin was Jesus. While I had accepted him into my life, I always viewed my sin as a reason to avoid him and to hide from him instead of turning to him. I read the self-help book I had on purity again. I started working on changing habits and actions to pursue a relationship with Jesus. And most importantly to my journey, I reached out to Jason to ask for his advice. But what he told me felt like the wrong answer. It didn't line up with what I had in mind. He told me to attend the church's recovery ministry and to look into working through a step study. This didn't make sense to me because I still thought I had all the answers, but I felt God telling me to give it a try. My first night at recovery, I was scared and nervous. I felt like the new kid at school on the first day of class. I told Burl why I came, and he explained how the recovery program worked and then arranged for me to join a step study with a group of men that accepted me with open arms. Regardless of the sins I confessed every week, they were genuinely happy to see me and welcomed me back the following week. I thought I would have a desire to avoid the individuals I opened up to about my issues in my past, but being open and honest actually turned out to have the opposite effect, and I look forward to seeing these men. In James chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Confess your sins one to another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Jason promised me this would be true in that very first message exchange, and though I didn't understand it at the time, I have now experienced that verse in practice and will testify to it as well. One of the greatest things that has aided in my recovery is to devote daily, especially in my known weak times or in times of temptation. Missing my daily devotional is one of the most common starts I've identified in a pattern of relapse. Another of the new activities that I've started is running. A good friend always tells me that to keep from losing the progress I've gained, I can't take more than two days off from running without my performance starting to deteriorate. When I break this rule, it is harder to get back into my run routine, and the first several runs are always more difficult. In my walk with Christ, I can't take any days off without experiencing a similar result. I also learned how to truly connect with God through praise and worship and began to pour my heart out both in recovery meetings and corporate worship with the church. I try to make it a point now to listen to Christian music daily in order main to maintain a worshipful heart. Praise and worship have even aided me in my recovery battle. At times of great temptation, I've been successful in turning to the Lord in worship instead of turning to sin in order to fulfill selfish desires of my flesh. One of the more difficult things God called me to do in recovery was to have discussions with my son about parts of my recovery journey. This included the topic of my adultery, pornography use, and lustful thought life. That was a hard talk to have, but it opened the door to discuss Jesus' sacrifice that paid for our sin and God's never-ending love and desire to see us draw nearer to him. 
Through the same avenues, God has inspired similar conversations with my daughter and I. With differing religious beliefs in the home over the last decade, I've never before shared with her my faith in Jesus as my Savior. This was a very intimidating conversation to have with a young lady who watched me live a very different life for the past several years, but it again gave me the opportunity to share about God's forgiveness through Jesus' sacrifice. Spending time in God's Word has helped me to understand His perspective as the patient, gracious, kind, and loving Father that He is. Learning this about Him has had a direct impact on my interactions with my children. Now I see God as a Father that wants to the best for me, and not simply as a rule maker who's angry with me when I step out of line. Trying to emulate this, I can serve Him better in the role that He's entrusted me with as a parent. The best part for me is that both of my children have told me they see a positive change in my life. That doesn't mean that I haven't stumbled along the way. I've still messed up a fair amount more than I'd care to admit, but I'm going to confess it. I'm still tempted with lustful thoughts, and I'm still tempted to view pornography. My temper flares up on occasion, and I don't always treat others with love as we are commanded to by Jesus. But when I look back at the person I was before starting recovery, I see the tremendous change that God has brought about in my life. Now when I look back, I can see that freedom from sexual sin is possible. God continues to grow my freedom from sexual sin, and I will continue to seek him. God does deliver us from undesirable situations. Sometimes, though, he just shelters us while we're still in them. I've been in some of those situations, but the biggest difference is now I have shelter in our Savior to see me through the tough times. I'm being delivered from the sins of the flesh that I once sought, and I'm walking a path of recovery from the damaging effects of years of self-indulgent sin and hurts that I had buried. In closing, I just want to offer a few words of perspective that I have often found encouraging. It's a journey, not a destination. Keep going. I no longer identify myself by my past sins or the sins of others against me. My name is Dustin, and I have new life in Christ. Would you join me in praying for Dustin? Father, we're just uh, so thankful for what you've done in the life of Dustin, uh, what you've done in my life and the life of countless other people. You are a God who gives new life. God, you're the one who takes a life that we thought was at the end, and, and you turn it around. You give us new life in you, and so we just praise you for what you've done in him. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all give him another hand. <clears throat> When they crucified Jesus, placed him in the tomb, any rational person would have thought that it was over. First day, came and went. Second day, came and went. His disciples went back to their prior professions, fishing, doing what they'd done. They thought it was over. But on the third day, Jesus Christ rose from the grave. He overcame what every one of us would say is impossible, death. He rose victorious over death. Death is the end for most, most of us. We think that's, that's over. And yet God wasn't done yet. He raised Jesus from the dead. He sent, Jesus ascended into heaven sent his Holy Spirit to live within those of us who would come to place our faith and trust in him. I want to tell you today that no matter where you are, no matter how bad life's gotten, no matter how deep the sin is, God's not done with you. There is still hope. God can still give you new life. Your life is not a lost cause. It's not too late. There's not a sin that God can't forgive. There's not a life that God can't transform. It's true for you. It's true for that family member that you're just struggling to hold on to hope in your prayers for them. It's true for your coworkers. It's true for your greatest enemy. There is always hope in Christ Jesus. He overcame the grave. He can overcome your sin. He's greater than death, and he's greater than the, the bonds that would hold us, which means there's always hope for you and for me. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, we're dead, there's no hope, right? God, who is rich in mercy, and because of his great love for us, he made us alive together with 
you just heard a testimony of how that's happened in Dustin's life. And I believe that God wants to do the same in you. As Paul was speaking to the Romans, he's in his letter to the Romans, he taught them about what faith is and how we ultimately come to faith in Jesus Christ, how we begin to experience this new life in Christ Jesus. Dustin actually laid this out for you without quoting the verse. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, it says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. With a heart, the person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with a mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. Believing God, that he is who he says he is, that he'll do what he says he will do, and confessing that with your mouth. That's the the route that we take, if you will. That's the process by which God has ordained for us to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, maybe you're here today and you say, I'm already a believer in Jesus. Today, can I just remind you to practice this once again? Would you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, that he'll do what he says he will do? Maybe for you, you're here, you're a believer in Jesus Christ, but you're not walking in obedience to him. And that's where confession comes in. That's what Dustin talked about. We confess our sins one to another and pray for each other that we may be healed. That somewhere along the way in our journey as believers in Jesus, we get off the rails a little bit. We get sidetracked. We find ourselves once again in sin. And the path to new life for us, believing once again in Jesus Christ, reminding ourselves who he is and what he's done for us. It's renewing our minds about who God truly is confessing our sin. It's repentance. We turn back and we follow him. But it's possible that you're here today. You've never known this new life in Christ. You've been going your own way. And you've been fighting against your sin. You've been trying to do better. Much like Dustin, you've kind of reached the end of yourself. Today, I believe Jesus wants to save I believe that Jesus wants to begin to work a new work in your heart. And it's believing that Jesus Christ died on the cross according to the scriptures. That he was buried. And then on the third day, he rose again according to the scriptures. It's trusting in Jesus Christ. That he is who he says he is. And he'll do what he said he will do. That he will forgive you and save you from your sins. We believe that. And then we confess it with our mouths. So if if that's you today, we're going to have an opportunity just after I pray. Well, I'm going to I'm going to give you the opportunity to trust Jesus Christ, to believe and to confess. Right now, I'm going to ask that everyone here in the room would bow their head and close their eyes. The band's going to come up and play. Uh, but right now, I just want to ask you to examine your heart. If you're here today and you're a believer, you're like, "Man, I, I know Jesus Christ. I've trusted him. I've come to faith in him." But And I haven't been living my life in accordance with the scriptures. I haven't been following after Jesus Christ. Man, I've got a sin issue that I need God to deliver me from. I need the new life that Christ can provide. I need to walk in that. If that's you today with every head bowed and every eye closed, would you just lift your hand? I'm going to pray for you. Uh, Just say, Jason, I've got some issues. Man, Dustin's story, it resonated with me. I've got some things going on. Would you just pray for me? Would anyone lift their hand and confess, hey, I need some prayer. I've got some things going on in my life. Thank you. Anyone else? Say, that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. hands down. If you're here today, never come to faith in Jesus Christ, and you've been fighting. The story of Dustin's kind of like your story. You got the details are changed, but you've been wrestling against sin. You know you've been apart from God, and today you've come to realize that you need a Savior. You've come to believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, that he was buried, he was raised on the third day. And today, your heart's been filled with faith, and you want to trust in Jesus Christ Would anyone be so bold as to raise their hand and say, Hey, Jason, today is the first day I've come to faith. Thank you. Somebody else? Raise your hand and say, Today I want to trust in Jesus Christ. I want to experience the new life that's available in Him. Anyone lift their hand and say that? Thank you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say a word of prayer for every one of you who's raised your hand today. And then we're going to have a time of invitation. If you raise your hand and said, hey, I've 
I want to trust Jesus Christ. I want to know what it is to be a follower of Jesus, a disciple of his. I'm going to be right down here in the front when we begin to sing. And I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to leave your seat and to come down here. I would like to pray with you and visit with you more about what it means to follow after Jesus. And if, if you're a little shy and you don't want to stand up in front of everybody, there's a card right there in your seat. If you would, just write your name there. Check the box about, hey, I, I trusted Jesus today and I need someone to follow up with me. You can do that and drop it in the offering box. But over these next few moments as we sing, would you just do business with God? I'm going to pray, and then I want you to come. Lord Jesus, I pray for those who want to believe you, uh, that you are a God who heals. You're a God who restores. You're the God that sets us free from sin. So, Lord, those who raised their hand and said, I'm a believer, but I'm struggling. God, I pray for the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray that you give them the grace to confess that sin. Not just to you, but to their fellow believer that they might be prayed for, that you might ultimately bring healing to them. God, I pray that you would release them from that addiction, from that sin, from that pain, that unforgiveness, whatever it might be. And Lord, for those who are here that raised their hand and said, I need to trust in Jesus, uh, my heart's been filled with faith. I believe that Jesus is who he said he is and that he's going to do the things he said he would do. Lord, I pray that they might follow after you, that today they might come to walk in that new life that's available in you. May you give them the boldness to come. God, I do pray that their hearts would be transformed. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Right now, I'm going to ask that you would stand. And if Jesus saved you today, I'm going to ask that you come forward.